Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Standard. I'm the founder and CEO here at Petabridge, and today we're gonna to talk about a .NET performance technique that we've been using very successfully to improve the performance of Akka.NET and uh, Phobos, which is our telemetry tool for Akka.NET. And this technique is called deferred allocations, and it's a means of moving allocation-heavy code out of your critical path and having it occur out of band instead. So to understand the problem context a little bit better, Imagine you have a hot path inside your application. Hot path is basically the critical execution flow that's responsible for delivering value to end users. So this could be an Akadana actor, could be an ASP.NET controller, uh, could be a signal or hub. It doesn't really matter what it is. All that we know is that inside this critical path, we want to try to keep the latency as low as possible because that's going to result in a better experience for the end user. It's also going to increase the maximum throughput per process that we might have. So it's generally beneficial to try to keep latency low here. However, we might also have a secondary set of requirements that are less latency sensitive, but are still really important. An example of this might include things like observability, so logging and telemetry. Or it might include things like internal facing business reports and analytics where decision makers inside our company are going to want to gather data from how customers or end users are interfacing with it and use that to help make some business decisions down the road. Well, both of those are really important requirements, but the problem is that most naive implementations of both A and B result in B having negative side effects on A. Namely, introducing things like telemetry creates a kind of observer effect, where the mere act of observing how our software is performing actually harms its performance. And this can occur in ways like heap allocations occurring, or stringification and enumerating objects. You know, both of these result in garbage collection pressure and overhead, which actually can have a fairly uh, big impact on your latency. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, I recommend watching our .NET Systems Programming Lessons Learn the Hard Way video, which I'll link to here. And then finally, some of these processes might include I.O., for instance. So if we're, you know, synchronously logging out to a file every single time an actor processes a message, that actor's going to process maybe one ten thousandth as many messages per second as it would if we didn't do that. So I.O. is many orders of magnitude more expensive than some of the other work this actor might be performing in memory, for instance. So what we want to try to do is we don't want to get rid of our telemetry or internal facing reporting. What we want to do is find a way to defer all of that expensive work so it happens out of band with everything that's happening in part A, our hot path. So to give you kind of a more visual example here, imagine a single Akadana actor. You know, actors basically have a mailbox, they have a queue of incoming messages they process, and each actor individually will process a message one at a time. If we have millions of different actors, they're all basically running clones of this exact same design you see on screen here. So we have an incoming message, an actor needs to process it and produce a response message. But in the course of processing that incoming message, we also might emit some telemetry here. That telemetry, if we're using a normal sort of naive implementation, is going to involve stringifying the content of the message, stringifying the sender's path, uh, maybe gathering some other domain-specific bits of telemetry, such as a request ID or a user ID, and basically adding all these different dimensions to our telemetry so we can search for it when it gets uploaded to Datadog or Elastic or Application Insights or whatever. The problem here is that doing all this work to allocate and populate those telemetry data items actually reduces the throughput, or another way of phrasing it, increases the amount of time it takes for an actor to process each of these messages. So as a result, this sort of telemetry requirement that we've imposed on our system here can actually have a fairly negative impact on the rate at which we can process messages. So to give you kind of a, a numerical example of this here, I'm gonna go ahead and use the open telemetry APIs from Phobos 2.31. That's one of the versions of Phobos that we produced over the past couple of years. And this is what our code looked like uh, inside the hot path of Phobos here. Every time an actor processed a message, we would go ahead and run this code up here. So let's kind of take a look at the amount of allocations that are happening inside this system every single time an actor processes a message. So first, we have to create a telemetry span. That's unavoidable. Uh, in order for us to get any telemetry, we have to do this. So there's no 
Nothing much we can really do to get away from that here. The other thing that we are going to do though, is we're adding some additional attributes. We have a set of initial attributes right here that are basically statically populated. So we're able to reuse that object over and over again. That's good. But we have some dynamic values that change on a per message basis in here. So we're adding these attributes to each one of these spans, which results in the internal span data structure allocating basically two new items to a list each time we do that. But on top of that, we're also doing things like stringifying the path of the actor, which results in this fairly expensive string construction exercise happening inside Akka.net. And we also do that here when we're trying to go ahead and extract the underlying messages type. Um, we might be able to cache this. In fact, I think we do inside Phobos, but still, that's a little bit of a hit. Next, we're adding another event for keeping track of processing time for messages. So that's gonna be one more uh, allocation to the internal events collection inside this telemetry span. And then finally, we're allocating a new span attributes type. We're converting the underlying message to a string right here. Uh, that's gonna actually be a fairly expensive operation, uh, particularly if you have users using things like record types in C Sharp. A record type, when you call to string on it, actually fires up a string builder and we'll go ahead and grab each of the different properties and inject them into a string. Uh, so this actually can be fairly expensive depending on how the to string method is implemented on the underlying type. And then finally, we have to take this object, uh, we have to take these attributes and then we have to add them back into that internal event collection, which is gonna result in one more internal, let's say room inside the span data structure being created. So there's a whole bunch of different allocations that are all happening while the actor's trying to do its work here. And so the outcome of this is that on my machine, a uninstrumented Akadana actor that doesn't have Phobos installed at all can do somewhere between, let's say, seven to eight million messages per second. Or really, I think it's more like seven million messages a second. Um, this actor, instrumented with Phobos, is able to do 1.15 million messages per second. So let's say it's operating at one sixth of the performance it had before. That's a fairly big impact just from adding telemetry to what this actor's doing. So what is our preferred solution here? How can we try to work around the performance problems that telemetry introduced into this code sample? Well, the most clear way of doing it is we don't want to necessarily have to drop our telemetry requirements because there's business value that we get from being able to do that. And we certainly don't want to have to try to engage in any giant exercise around trying to find ways to speed up uh, the way we do our actual work inside this actor. We know based off our measurement that the work happens pretty quickly in here. So what we're going to try to do instead is redesign the way we implement our requirements from area B, telemetry and log emission in this case. We want to go ahead and try to change it such that those telemetry events basically get stubbed by the actor where we do a bunch of very cheap and expensive operations inside the critical path and the full expansion of all the telemetry data that we need. That's like stringifying the payloads, enumerating off of all the different tags and events we're adding to our traces. All of that can happen in the telemetry pipeline itself, which runs asynchronously out of band with our, with our mission critical code happening inside this actor. That's our preferred solution here because it doesn't require any data loss and doesn't require tampering with the really important domain specific work this actor does. This is essentially a technical improvement, not a change in requirements. So let's see how we can actually go about facilitating that by changing the way we work with the open telemetry implementation in .NET. So one of the things that we've done is before we were using the open telemetry.api NuGet package, which is an abstraction on top of system.diagnostics.activity. Uh, what we have done here is we've actually switched to using system.diagnostics.activity directly. And the reason being for this is that it exposes some APIs that will allow us to perform prefer, uh, deferred stringification much more easily. So we're going to try to take advantage of this lower level abstraction in order to squeeze a lot more performance out of our telemetry code. So the first thing that we're gonna do here is I actually created a little data structure and we're gonna see this uh, in a couple of slides. I created a data structure that allows me to take all of the different tags. Tags are basically dimensions you can use to search uh, for trace activity in OpenTelemetry. This allows me to basically aggregate 
all of the tags together without any allocations. So this little initial tags data structure is an immutable struct. It's a value type that sits on the stack, not the heap. So I'm able to go ahead and move all of these this tag data into there. So no allocations here so far. Here we're going to go ahead and create our span again. That's an unavoidable source of allocations. We had to do that in order to have any telemetry. So we'll do that here. And then we're going to go ahead and go back to adding our events. Now this activity event type is a struct. So this occurs on the stack, not on the heap. So there's no allocations there. But this add event call is going to add one item to the internal linked list that the activity uses for tracking events. So there's going to be one uh, linked list node there. And then we're going to add another linked list node here for being able to capture data about the type of message being processed. But here is probably the biggest single performance saving trick inside all this code here is we're going to stick this enumerable right here, this little I enumerable, we're going to stick this in this activity tags collection right here. Uh, that is going to result in this message getting stringified only once the span is being exported to whatever our destination is. So that might be Datadog or application insights or whatever. That's going to move probably the most expensive source of, let's say, allocation activity completely out of the actor and have it happen instead in our telemetry pipeline, which runs on its own schedule completely independently from the rest of our application. We're going to get into the details of how some of the stuff works in just a moment, but let's take a look at the performance results between Phobos 2.5 and 2.31. We're now doing about 3 million messages a second instead of 1.1 million messages a second. So a roughly a 161% improvement over what we had before. So that's fantastic. That's a, a really significant improvement. So instead of doing like one sixth of the performance that we would normally get with, uh, without Phobos, uh, we're getting one half of it instead. So that's a pretty substantial improvement in exchange for free telemetry. Now, what are the actual techniques that make the system work? How do you achieve deferred allocation of all these objects? Well, one technique, and this technique I first saw uh, looking through the open telemetry implementation in .NET uh, for working with things like uh, tags for metrics, is to basically create structs that implement the I enumerable interface. Uh, this is still going to potentially create a tiny allocation that occurs as a result of boxing. This I enumerable might get boxed into a heap type anyway. That's okay. That's not the end of the world. That's still way cheaper than allocating, let's say, an array that has these four items in it. So what we're going to do here is rely on lazy enumeration, meaning that this object can only get enumerated, you know, basically once someone actually starts looping through it. It doesn't have a, a collection we can loop through over and over again. So we're using a bunch of old school, you know, C-sharp one methods here. We're basically using the yield keyword and we're returning this object as the enumeration is happening. Bear in mind, key value pair is also a struct. So that's going to go ahead and you know, be a, a, stack a stack type, a value type, uh, not a heap type as well. The other thing that we're doing inside the same little data structure here to really save on allocations is we're not rendering the strings for things like the message type or the sender. These were some of our other expensive sources of allocations earlier. This doesn't happen until the enumeration is already underway. Therefore, all of that expensive rendering that we were doing inside you know, the actor's core message processing pipeline before, that now happens during the open telemetry export pipeline instead. It's happening completely out of band with our normal high performance code. Uh, we also did the same thing if I go back in time here. We also did the same thing here with this create span attributes method. We're returning a little I enumerable, and this I enumerable doesn't actually get looped through until we're exporting this event in the telemetry pipeline. So this technique is very good at being able to go ahead and move all these heavy sources of allocation to somewhere where the latency penalty is a lot lower. So what are some things to remember about trying to use this deferred allocation technique? The first is that the consuming API, in this case, OpenTelemetry, or maybe something like Microsoft.extensions.logging, or the Aka.net logging system, they have to be capable of deferring enumeration and stringification until they absolutely have to. So in the case of like the Aka.net logging system, uh, we rewrote it in Aka.net 1.5 to basically use this same type of technique where we don't render the format string until this thing is getting exported to its final destination. That moves a whole bunch of sources of allocation out of your actors and has it happen out of band, just like Microsoft.extensions.logging does as well. 
So you need to make sure your consuming API supports deferring the allocation of all these resources. The other thing is that deferring allocation is something that makes sense when the allocated objects aren't mission critical. So for example, if we're using telemetry as our use case for deferred allocation here, no one's gonna die because we missed a log message or missed a single span. Now, if you miss a lot of them, that's a different story, but we generally aren't gonna be upset about a single log going missing inside of our system. Ditto with maybe a single entry that might appear inside an internal business report, right? That's not the end of the world if that happens. But if this is something critical, like a notification being sent to an end user or notification being sent to your fulfillment team, uh, in that case, deferred allocation might actually create a couple of unintentional side effects that uh, impact the consistency of that approach. So you may not want to use this technique in those areas. But in, technique, but in areas where availability is ultimately more important than consistency, deferred allocation is a really useful technique, and you should try to take advantage of it. So... Thank you very much for your time, and uh, please let us know if you have any questions.